here and uh, we're going to um, allow uh, those of you who the mentors who will be starting uh, this upcoming academic year to have some interaction with the senior mentors. Uh, if you have some questions of specific things you would like to uh, ask them since they um, have some experience working with a CLIP resident, if you would uh, share those questions uh, with everyone in the chat. Okay, so if you have questions for the senior mentors, you can share those questions in the chat. And then Ms. Howell has agreed to, uh, you know, read those questions and, and allow them um, uh, some time to answer. Okay. All right, as I said, for the second part of our training, we're going to talk specifically about uh, the NSU evaluation instrument, uh, your role in um, evaluating the performance of the residents in your classroom. Uh, we're going to also uh, go over the um, scope and sequence of activities and um, tasks that the residents uh, should be doing in your classroom uh, over the course of the semester. Uh, and we will finish up with just giving you some time to uh, think again about how you're going to approach uh, this process as the school year uh, begins. I also want to let you know and, and re will remind you because Ms. Um, Callie mentioned yesterday that there will be two more days of training. And I'm extremely hopeful that those trainings will be conducted face-to-face. Uh, -face. I hope we're at that point. And just know that we will spend more time together. So there's some things that you know I wasn't able to uh, uh, fully expound on, but uh, when we meet again, we'll talk more about co-teaching. We'll look at a co-teaching lesson plan. Um, we'll, um, you'll have an opportunity to um, view a video and evaluate a lesson using the instrument. Uh, because you know we want um, to ensure that our candidates are getting that uh, consistent feedback so that is a, a, a something that we'll do uh, when we meet and we'll talk about we'll come up with a date um, Ms. Callie will reach out to you all about dates that will be ideal for you uh, based on your school schedules okay when we're planning that uh, when someone just asked um, do you have dates for those for the trainings yet uh, someone just ask that question yes so i uh, know uh what i usually like to do is just send out a poll on some days that work for everybody so i'll send that out via doodle poll and that way um because i know it's hard to, to coordinate for everyone to be together because everyone has different schedules so i try to utilize that to help select days that best works for everybody okay thank you well, we don't have any questions. Um, we don't have any questions yet uh, for our senior mentors. So I just really want to uh, just take a few minutes because uh, I feel like it's very powerful um, for them to share a little bit more about their experiences. So I'll ask each of the uh, mentors who are continuing with CLIP residents this year, if you will just start by, um, if you'll just start by telling uh, something that you um, found that was a benefit of having um, the resident in your classroom. Uh, Ms. Jones, would you start? Um, one of the benefits that I had was just having a classroom full of students and being able to have two teachers in there at one time. But you know, you may be doing something and they could be helping someone else or pulling someone, you know, to the side for additional help and things like that. And it also gives you opportunity to evaluate yourself as a teacher. You know, sometimes we get in the habit of doing certain things and when you're actually trying to help someone else become a better teacher, you kind of look at some things that you may need to, you know, change or adjust um, yourself. So it gives you a chance to evaluate yourself as well. Thank you so much. And those are things that we talked about um, yesterday and uh, also today as we're looking at co-teaching strategies and the benefits of uh, co-teaching, having the two teachers in the classroom and the power that that brings. So uh, I appreciate you uh, sharing those uh, those things, Ms. Jones. Uh, Mr. McGraw, um, would you please share with us? Some of the benefits that um, I noticed last year, um, you get a different perspective on things. Um, hey, your volume is low. I don't know if you can. Let's see. 
All right. So um, I was saying that um, you get a different perspective on things. And so at, at the end of the day, you sit there and you're adjusted to doing things a certain way. You're in your certain year of teaching and you're going to do it that same way, so on and so forth. But then that mentee comes in and they sit there and they give you that new perspective to sit here and look at it. And oftentimes they sit there and they give you, you know, a great route to go and you get to see, you know, different sides of things. Another great benefit that um, I experienced last year was not necessarily uh, losing a hitch whenever you had to be out of the classroom. You know, after you get to a certain point in that school year and you know you're required to be off for professional development or such, um, you don't necessarily lose any steps. Yes, because the resident is there and able to, you know, uh, continue on even with a substitute teacher uh, being in the classroom. And we had a discussion about that yesterday as well. And that um, I'm glad that you uh, noted that there are some things that uh, you were able to learn from the residents because the residents are taking classes. And as I mentioned, um, they are coming from different professional backgrounds. And so they're bringing some knowledge and some skills that certainly can be helpful uh, to them uh, in the classroom uh, and in the teaching profession. So I'm, I'm so glad that you pointed those things, um, those things out. And uh, finally, Ms. Clark, um, I don't know if you're able to. I'm going to try. Can you hear me better now? Yes, we can hear you better now. Okay, absolutely. Um, I agree with the others. There were a lot of things that I learned from my resident that I wasn't aware of. Also going through the same traditional like writing lesson plans, things like that, that had kind of become redundant, repetitive to me. I was more in touch with the details. Where did you get that information? Things I was taking for granted for a long time. Um, it caused me to kind of reevaluate how I did things, why I did things. Um, walking her through step by step was interesting. She taught me a lot uh, that she had picked up from classes about um, like technology and use of some of the technology like with gel provided through the clip program for her to use we kind of learned it together hand in hand so that was beneficial as well I enjoyed it and I find that this year is going to be another new experience I welcome the new ideas that this teacher has to bring as well yes so um, an opportunity for growth not just for the the mentee but for the mentor but you the right. mentor as well yes okay um, so um, I would also now like for you all to um, just share maybe a challenge that you had in this process uh, because um, we have also been talking to them about uh, some of the challenges, some of the things that uh, may come up that they need to uh, address with residents, you know, how they would handle a situation if uh, a resident um, was teaching and uh, they uh, have made a content error. We've discussed that. Uh, we've discussed um, uh, residents possibly wanting to uh, work on homework assignments from their courses uh, during class time. So uh, if you all will discuss maybe uh, one challenge that uh, you had uh, during this and, and how you overcame that challenge. And I'll, I'll, uh, I won't call on, on you to speak now. I'll just let you know, you won't think about it for a second. And then if you'll just volunteer to talk about a challenge and, and how you would address that challenge. Well, I, I would like to just uh, let you guys know about the time constraint. When you sit there and you stop and you've got to sit there and you've got to co go back and go down to the basics and the foundations of a lot of the things that you're doing, things that normally would take you like five minutes to do are going to take you like 20, you know, with your resident. And so one of the things I was unprepared for last year was really the um, challenge of time that I was faced with um, that put a lot of extra work you know on the weekends and stuff like that for me and that's how I kind of had to handle it just because of my uh, certain situation we got to the point where we were staying after school together and working on some stuff and so um, that that would be just one challenge that I would want to bring up okay. and maybe that's something that you know you all can address with your principal so um, see if there's a additional time during the day where you could have uh, more time for, for planning because you know as you we learned about and talked about co-teaching um, for co-teaching to take place there has to be co-planning uh, for it, it, it to work um, so you might want to talk to your principal they are aware that you have a resident in the classroom they're aware of how this program is, is structured 
Uh, so, uh, but there are many teachers who have to who stay after school normally, even if they don't have a residence to prepare for the next day. Uh, teaching is is tough work, uh, and it goes beyond just the uh, seven thirty to three thirty uh, hours, uh, as you know, if if you want to be effective in it. Uh, but you know, once that flow gets, once you you get started in the flow, and you you are able to get to the point of, of team teaching and the resident is comfortable being there and the resident is, is growing in their knowledge, uh, that should uh, also take away some of the, um, the planning and uh, activities on your part because you all are sharing the responsibilities in the classroom. Miss um, Clark or Miss Jones? Yes, ma'am. Um I'd just like to add to them. I also had issues with the time thing, but we did work it into our schedule. We stayed after school as well. We found that that was the time we had that worked the best for us. But I wanted to point out another unexpected obstacle that we noticed. My uh, resident had never been in front of a group of kids before. She had never actually taught or substitute taught or, or, you know, any type of situation like that. And I didn't expect that. So when we went from just an observation phase, it, that was a big obstacle. She was very nervous. She was a natural. It went well, but I hadn't kind of foreseen that. So I was just like, okay, your turn. And she had these big scared eyes and, you know, I knew she was prepared, but that was something that we didn't anticipate. So I kind of, I'll be more prepared this time, but I'd like to point out to like the, the new ones, just take that into consideration. That's kind of a big deal. That's a scary moment for them. They feel prepared, but then they have all these eyes looking at them and I'm watching and little things like that that popped up along the way that I didn't see coming. Yes, and um, yeah, so some of the residents there um, have, have never been in the classroom before and we discussed that uh, yesterday. Um, and so uh, that is why, you know, there has to be a gradual release of responsibility. Um, we're going to look at some of the things that they can uh, do in the beginning to help them to gain their sea legs and to become more confident over time. But uh, I do want you to know, um, just as Ms. Clark pointed out, that some of these uh, the residents have not been in a classroom uh, at all. Okay? And so um, you don't want to push them out there too quickly. And as you push them out there, you want to be that safety net, um, you know, for them. Um, that's why it's going to be important for you to build uh, relationships of trust and honesty, as we discussed yesterday. So they will be open to taking risk um, and feel safe taking risk in your in your classrooms. Okay. This summer, they are taking three uh, courses. I don't know if I identified those courses yesterday. I know uh, Ms. Howell and I mentioned it, uh, but the, the courses they are taking this summer, I, I told you they're taking the educational psychology class. Uh, they're also taking a literacy-based lesson class, uh, a literacy-based uh, lesson planning methodology course uh, with, where they are learning about the um, lesson planning, the Danielson um, framework, which our instrument is aligned with the Danielson framework. Um, they um, are in a course that where they're being introduced to classroom management, um, instructional strategies. So they are going to be coming to you with uh, information with with theory. Uh, so their uh, the summer coursework is designed to lay that foundation, but their learning will continue over the fall, spring, um, and the summer 2021 uh, semester. But so they, they aren't just coming to you with, with, with no knowledge, but they're certainly not going to be ready to step immediately in front of a group of, of children. Okay. And Ms. Jones, will, will you share now? Um, um, this past year, I was actually fortunate enough to have a, a good resident. I, we really didn't have any major challenges. And with my schedule, I actually had like my planning and like an athletic PE at the end of the day. So we kind of had plenty of time to do a lot of um, co-planning together and being able to give feedback at the end of the day after we went through all the classes. Um, just a personal challenge within myself. Um, I had to learn how to give constructive, you know, criticism sometimes. That was 
that was very <laughs> challenging to me, you know, to kind of tell somebody what they're doing wrong in a way that, you know, that you're not rude or anything, you know, like that and actually give them a suggestion to, you know, improve it or make it better. But actually, um, we had a good year. And another thing was just being able to just relinquish a little control of my classroom to her. That was a big thing um, with me as well. But as it went along, it became, you know, easier. It's just hard to find that right time to say, okay, now you can teach your lesson and, you know, things like that and kind of let her do her thing just a little bit. And, you know, so she get comfortable with being in front of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, for those of you who were um, new mentors who were here yesterday, hopefully um, you, um, as, as you heard um, Ms. Clark, Mr. McGraw, and Ms. Jones share, you thought about some of the things that we have been <laughs> discussing for the past two days now about, you know, residents. And we talked yesterday about, about feedback and how some of the candidates aren't very receptive to that constructive feedback uh, in the beginning, but it is important, it is an extremely critical part uh, of, their, of their learning. And so I think this is a perfect segue into um, looking at the evaluation instrument and talking about how many times you're going to be required to formally evaluate uh, the candidate's uh, instruction. So um, I also told you that the candidates are, are assigned a university supervisor and that uh, external person will be coming in uh, to your classroom to evaluate the candidate's uh, instruction as well. Uh, I say they're coming in, but it really just depends um, uh, on what's going on in the world because um, I know that schools are limiting the number of visitors and the number of people uh, in the classroom and so the university supervisor may be required to just uh, view uh, a video of the candidates instruction but we will talk about that you know when we you know we get to that point when schools actually figure out <laughs> when they're starting and what it's going to look like but just know that the university supervisor, as I said, will be there to provide additional support and feedback uh, about the candidates, the performance, and uh, give them the information they uh, need to grow uh, to the point um, that we, we would like for them to grow. But during the first semester, um, you as the uh, mentor will be required to formally evaluate the resident's instruction four times. Okay, so you might want to make note of that. You will be required to formally evaluate the resident's instruction four times this fall. And you will be required to use the Northwestern Evaluation Instrument. And our instrument is aligned with the uh, Danielson framework. And I know that you all are familiar with Danielson because the COMPASS evaluation the five uh, components of COMPASS are from Danielson, but we take into uh, consideration all 22 of the Danielson, uh, components of the Danielson uh, framework for teaching. And so uh, I want to, I'm gonna start sharing my screen with you again in just a, a minute. Um, and so during the fall, you will evaluate their instruction four times. The university supervisor will evaluate the candidate's instruction two times this fall. So the candidate will have six formal evaluations in all this fall. And then in, in the spring, we flip-flop. The university supervisor formally evaluates the candidate's instruction four times, and you formally evaluate their instruction twice. Okay. So um, over the course of the two semester internship, the candidate is formally evaluated 12 times. Okay. And Ms. Howell and I will talk to you about uh, timelines for those evaluations. It will be very critical that you sit down uh, at the beginning of the semester with the candidate to map out when those formal evaluations are going to take place. Uh, it's going to be even more critical that you sit down with them in the spring, early in the spring, to um, 
to map out and to get on the calendar um, the evaluation dates because what happens in the spring that could impact this work? Are you all still with me? What is something that happens in the spring that could have an impact on the evaluation? Testing. Testing, Testing. Testing. yes. Testing, and also in the spring, that is when, as uh, we talked about, there's a gradual release of responsibility where the candidate will take the lead teacher position. Um, by the spring, the candidate should uh, be in the lead teacher position for at least 10 days, five of which must be consecutive. And so I want to say that to you now because we have the evaluations, the formal evaluations to work out, as well as testing to work around when you are planning these things. And um, we will be meeting in the fall and we'll discuss again and um, you know, look at calendars when we meet uh, to help you uh, get everything together and you know, get a plan together for the spring. But I want to mention it to you now. So do you all have any questions? Any concerns? I have a concern. Um, Ms. Jones mentioned it earlier when we dismissed in March suddenly. I'm sure that created a challenge for you and your resident teacher. Um, do How do we handle that or is that decided when it happens? I mean, do you have any advice for me, Ms. Jones, or any of the other teachers? Well, we hope that never happens again. That was our first time. Um, and fortunately, with the, the state uh, stepped in and they waived uh, some of the re requirements um, because, you know, we finished, we, the schools ended up closing in mid-March and that was just midway through the semester. Um, so it, the issue was, and I, and I put timelines in place here that mentor teachers and university supervisors should have at least half of their evaluations done by midterm. And sometimes um, we have mentor teachers and university supervisors who don't do that. And so for those who didn't do it, um, it caused uh, an issue um, with the candidates. But again, for, it, it could have caused an issue if the state hadn't waived um, the evaluation requirements and the hours. And so, you know, that being said, it is critical that you stick with the timelines and that you um, submit things by the due dates. That is critical. And so um, university supervisors were like, oh my goodness, well, I was planning to, um, but then there wasn't an opportunity because schools were closed. And so I want to say that, you know, when we give deadlines, uh, it's important that you get that information to me because the candidates' grades come from these formal evaluations. And you all are teachers, you know that you know, when grades are due, you need your assignments, you need to get them in on time. It's the same thing for me. And Ms. Howell will tell you that I'm running around because I, I am very organized and I like to get things done as, as even early. <laughs> if, but I am dependent. I'm at the mercy of university supervisors and mentor teachers. I'm at, their, at your mercy for you getting the information to me that I need to get the candidates' grades in the system. So please, you know, stick to the timelines uh, as you are sitting down with your calendar for this fall. Uh, you know, by midpoint in the semester, you should have done, uh, completed two evaluations, at least out of the four that you're required to do. And then two more um, by the date at the end of the semester. And I will send all of that uh, information to you and a copy of our academic calendar uh, as well. So um, you will know when the last day of semester uh, is and when you have to have all of the paperwork to me. I agree having the the timeline and deadlines did help a lot because by the time school, you know, did let out well, March 13th, we actually had gotten a lot, you know, done before that time. Like she was able to even get her five consecutive, you know, days of teaching, you know, done before that. And I think I had completed all of my formal evaluations on her. So we pretty much had got, you know, most everything done you know, knowing we had those deadlines in place and testing was coming up. 
So we were trying to get a lot done before the testing part, you know, came along anyway. Yes. And Ms. Jones, that's why we are so glad to have you back. That's why you are a great teacher. That's why I didn't have to drive and knock on your door. You guys, it is so important to turn the things in. And it's not just mailing in. You can scan now. You can steal fax. Um, if for some reason, you know, you can call and whether it be Miss Callie, myself, I will drive over there and pick up whatever you need. But while Miss Winder is talking about university supervisors, sometimes they will need to speak to you. Versus if there's something going on and they're giving that resident recommendations, sometimes they have to speak to you. And there may be a time where your planning was that morning, they came that afternoon. Whether you, you know, give them your phone number, that's strictly up to you, that's your personal number. If they call you at school, you know, please return their call within 24 hours because they're just like you. They have to turn in their observation, their evaluation, but there will be times when they have to speak with you and just please give them that courtesy. You know, we're not asking for that day, but at least in a 24 hour period, find a way to get back in contact with them. They'll leave their number. So if you just want to strictly talk to them at school, then the next day when you get a chance, but it's imperative that when they're trying to talk to you, it's about their evaluation. And at the end of the year, you and the university supervisor have a form that you complete together. Yes, well, at the end of each semester, they have a, uh, you, have, you and the university supervisor will need to sit down and you will complete um, an assessment, uh, which is the end, is the end of semester evaluation, and that is to be done collaboratively. Uh, and you might also remember yesterday, I told you that you will also be required to uh, complete an assessment of the, um, the candidate's professional dispositions and behaviors. Uh, so I will share that form with you as well. So I'm going to start sharing my screen now so you can see uh, the, our instrument. Okay, you should be able to see the instrument now. And give me a nod if you can see it. Okay, all right. So this is our uh, evaluation instrument. Uh, it is made up of a four of of four pages, but uh, three parts, three parts, four pages. And as I said, it is aligned with the Danielson uh, framework as well as the, um, the standards for uh, each of the professional organizations. And before you guys freak out, it does come with a rubric. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does come with a rubric. Well, page one does. And the guidance for the evaluation of page two, um, you would use the profession, the um, documents of the professional, uh, the standards for the professional organizations. Uh, so here is the form. And so this is page one, this is a pedagogy page. And it is divided into uh, three domains, planning and preparation, the classroom environment and instruction. And you would, um, here's the rubric criteria, the, the rating scale, the candidate can receive a one, two, or a three, um, one being ineffective all the way up to a three being effective emerging. And uh, here is just some guidance to choosing um, or deciding whether the rating for the candidate, whether it be a one, two, or a three. Uh, a one, the candidate, candidate did not address this indicator at all. The candidate addressed one or more components of the indicator, but not at the expected level, or the candidate addressed all components of the indicator at the expected level of uh, performance. Okay. Uh, you know, it may seem like the, a lot of the formal evaluations that uh, the candidate will be receiving, but as you know, the way that our candidates grow is through feedback. They need feedback, continuous, ongoing, uh, targeted, of feedback for improvement. And so uh, the evaluations, of course, uh, lend themselves to uh, you doing that. And um, not that you won't just give them feedback on a daily basis with the things they're doing in the classroom, but uh, this, this, the feedback here is specific and in all the areas in which they uh, need to grow to become effective. So um, 
I won't read all these to you, but we'll just have a, a brief discussion and you will have a copy of this. And as I said, the next time we meet, we'll look at it uh, even more closely because, and you will use it because you will watch a video and evaluate uh, uh, and a te the teacher's discussion um, using this instrument. And then we'll have conversations about, you know, your ratings and we'll compare and all of that. But uh, just looking at under planning and preparation, the first one, demonstrating knowledge of content and pedagogy. What stands out here? What, uh, give me some examples of what you would be looking for for this particular um, component. Um, I think like using correct terminology and uh, it should be evident in their planning. That's where I would get my evidence from. And then in the delivery of the lesson, if they seem to have knowledge of the skills being taught, where they got them, why they got those particular um, like grade level descriptors, that sort of thing, where we draw our planning from. Okay. So here you would, um, you would you know, choose the rating based on not only the, the candidate's deliver, delivery of the instruction, but also looking at their lesson plans as well. And you might remember that I said that, you know, when candidates are formally evaluated, they have to use the NSU lesson plan template. And uh, I will show you a, a copy of it. And <laughs> It's a beast. It's um, very, uh, but I'm sure you all remember from, you know, your times of going through teacher preparation that uh, the lesson plans uh, ask for a lot of uh, information, but that's because we want our candidates to clearly think through all of those important aspects, the critical components of a lesson uh, before they stand in front of a group of children. Okay, uh, so I want to um, point out and looking at this one, um, this particular uh, component here. Um, demonstrate knowledge of content and pedagogy. Okay, so you're not just looking at content knowledge and you're not just looking at, at pedagogy, you're looking at both. So if the candidate um, did, um, you know, for this one, you won't just look at if they, you know, made, if they made errors uh, in the with the the instruction in the lesson, but you know with the pedagogy they planned they planned it out and they used appropriate uh, strategies for that particular content area. Then you know you wouldn't they wouldn't receive a a three on this one. It would be a two would be more appropriate uh, here if they made a content area, but a content error, but at the same time they implemented appropriate strategies for the content area. So, I mean, you would just, I want you to be mindful that some of these say and, that there are multiple components and things that you should be looking for, okay? Uh, also, I want to make note that about this, that you are going to be required to um, provide evidence, specific evidence from the lesson provide brief statement of evidence to support an ineffective or an emerging proficient rating because often uh, evaluators look over this and they will have nothing but ratings and no evidence to support their ratings. You have to provide evidence from the lesson to support your rating. So, what does that mean for you as you're evaluating because you're going to be required to provide evidence from the lesson as you're evaluating? What would that mean as you are observing the lesson? What does that mean that you will need to do? Write notes or script where our, what evidence we see throughout the lesson or the lesson planning process. You're muted. You'll hear you, thank you. You'll need to script, take detailed notes, and not just look at what the teacher is doing, but also what the students are doing, because that is one area that, you know, when they came out to evaluate our programs, um, you know, for our credit, the, for accreditation, and they were reviewing uh, the evaluations completed by university supervisors and mentor teachers. You know, the evaluators pointed out to us that, you know, that there should be some student focused feedback, some learner based feedback uh, provided. So, not just look at the teacher's behaviors, 
but the student's behaviors as well, because we know that there is a connection between the two. Okay, so keep that in mind. And again, we're going to practice that also. So this is page one. And our page two is content specific. So for all candidates, regardless of the content area they are pursuing, the evaluator uses page one. Page two or form two is content specific. So this is the the page two that is specific for math. So for those of you who are math teachers and you have students that are pursuing math certification, this is the page two. Um, and um, the same thing, same requirements, one, two, or three. You have to provide evidence from the lesson to support a one or a three uh, rating. That doesn't mean that you can't provide evidence to support a two. You want to give some uh, suggestions about how the candidate can move from a two to a three. So don't think you're just limited to writing a statement for a one or a three. And so this is page two. And then there's one that's specific for science. This is it. And then the final form is our page three and our form three, pages three and four. Uh, this is where you summarize the candidate's performance. You give specific feedback uh, for improvement and you calculate um, their, their grade. And so here, recommendations for continued practice. So you're going to cite at least one area of strength uh, uh, from the lesson. And so here, this is, I said yesterday, an area of reinforcement. So this is something that the candidates did a good job on during the lesson. And so you'll talk to them about, you know, did you, if, if they did an excellent job with questioning, you will list that at here. And then you'll provide evidence from the lesson that would support a high rating on questioning. So give me some examples of evidence that could be in a lesson where a teacher has done an excellent job with questioning. I guess you could, you know, kind of mention how the kids respond and, you know, reply to the different questions that um, the candidate may, may ask. And especially if they answer it correctly, you know, to where you can see that they actually did, you know, comprehend and understand, you know, what she was, um, you know, teaching at that moment. So basically, you know, with the students' reactions and things to her own questioning. Okay, so student responses to the teacher's questions. Um, I'm sorry. Also, I think uh, to make sure that the questions are well worded and do reflect back to the uh, learning criteria, the student criteria and the learning targets that were designed for that lesson. Okay, so the questions are aligned with the lesson objectives or lesson outcomes. Uh, what about um, the candidates scaffold, uh, that scaffolded the questions from, uh, to ensure, you know, student understanding. So maybe there was a scaffolding of questions. The candidate asked higher order questions. The candidate called on uh, volunteers as well as non-volunteers uh, during the lesson. Uh, the candidate built on students' responses to questions. Um, so those would all be, you know, evidence that could all be evidence from a lesson to support a strong rating in questioning. Can you all think of any others? The candidate uses it to meet levels of diversity in the students. Like she uses lower level questions for the lower sped students and higher level questions for the um, gifted students. So she's meeting the needs of the students. Mm -hmm. So through sense for all of them. 
Okay, so it kind of sounds like uh, scaffolding there, questions building up or, you know, asking questions appropriate for the candidates, uh, for the students level of performance. Uh, what about wait time? The teacher provided appropriate wait time um, for questions. And that's something that's difficult for our candidates because they, you know, just sitting and waiting like I sit and wait for you all to answer. <laughs> for some of them, that time is just, you know, drives them crazy. And so they immediately want to be like, well, it Forrest uh, Bueller's um, teacher and answer their own question. <laughs> so, a Ferris Bueller's teacher and answer their own question. But uh, yeah, so I just want you to, to think about, you know, you would have to provide some ex specific examples from the lesson to support whatever the candidate is doing, why they did a good job, why they should continue doing it, the importance of asking adequate questions and building on student responses and higher order thinking and so on. Okay, uh, the next part of it is you have to identify one area of growth and there may be multiple things that a candidate needs to work on. Um, I know that's going to be the case uh, in the beginning, but you have to choose the one that uh, will give you the biggest bang for the buck, like the one that's most critical uh, to address here. You cannot overwhelm them with lots of suggestions at one time. Okay. So a uh, continued growth objective, uh, say uh, let's in the lesson, um, they did not, um, hmm, let's, let's do the opposite um, here. What if questioning was, um, no, I wanna do something different. Let's talk about uh, differentiated instruction. What if an area that you noticed in the lesson was differentiated in instruction? What are some examples of some things that happen in lessons that um, would um, end up with a low uh, rating for differentiated instruction? Are you asking for like, um ideas for improvement, what we would recommend for them to improve, Ms. Winder? Uh, not yet. I want to, like, okay, so I, when I observe a lesson, I was like, um, and if it's an area that the candidate, you know, did not do well in, differentiated instruction, what are some things that might have happened in the lesson or might not have happened in the lesson that would lead to a low rating for differentiated instruction? Think about the new mentors. Think about in your own instruction. I know that you all are evaluated using Compass. What are some of the things that the principal has pointed out to you or that you know you have gone into a classroom and evaluated someone using the Compass, Compass rubric? If all the activities were planned for a certain level of, of achievement, like if they were all planned for um, higher learners in the group and not taking to account, um, like Ms. Jones said, some of the um, lower level students in our group, that might be a lack of differentiation. Yes, that would be. If all of the students were asked to complete the same assessment, and it's obvious that you have a student in the group who is a slow reader or you know has reading difficulty, or you have mentioned that you have uh, students in the classroom who, um, who uh, have uh, special needs or or you have um, you know though and but at the same time you have the same expectation on the assessment for everyone then that means that you did not think through a, a much about uh, differentiating the instruction something else that I've noticed is that if all of the activities are, uh, aud are for auditory learners like a teacher just getting up and lecturing and not having any visuals, no PowerPoints, or, or if you um, are even having um, instruction that is not developmentally appropriate. So those are some things that you could have here as examples from the lesson that would support a low rating and differentiated instruction. And the only way that you can have that evidence and be able to provide it here is if you have taken very good notes while you are observing. And so for me, when I sit down to evaluate a student, I have a notebook and I divide the page, I draw a line on this side at the top, I put teacher on this side, on the other side, I put student and I script what the teacher says, what the teacher does, what the students say, what the students do. And so 
I am able to go back and refer to that uh, at the end. If you have difficulty uh, keeping up with and writing, maybe you want to record the lesson and it doesn't have to be video recorded. Um, you should have a recording, um, a way to record using your cell phone or you might have a, you know, a regular small uh, recorder of some sort so you, of some sort so you can go back and listen to the lesson but it's important that you you know take good notes so that you can provide uh, adequate feedback to the candidate and then suggestions for improvement which is the next part of what we're getting into so model and or suggestions for meeting continued growth objective okay so here's where you're going to list some specific suggestions for improvements of what you um, have you know, cited as an area of growth and anything else that, that you want to address here. So with differentiated, if differentiated instruction, uh, I would mention that you know, have uh, assessments appropriate or reading materials at, for varying levels of students, okay? So if, if you, know, you have slow readers in the group, then have reading materials that are appropriate for them or have a listening station set up for them, something. Uh, if questioning were a weakness and the students weren't, if they were just calling on volunteers during the lesson, then maybe I would suggest that they use some type of random selector and I would have that listed here for them and I could give them examples of it and why it's important to call on um, uh, volunteers and non-volunteers and we'll have that discussion, but this is where you list all of these suggestions that you have. And then the next part is evidence of implementation of recommendations from previous observations. So you're, you are going to revisit in each, each subsequent lesson, you're going to go back and you're going to note whether or not the candidate um, implemented the suggestions that, that you made, because sometimes they, they don't, okay? But it is important that they do because we want them to grow in their practice. So, if you, when you go back, you know, for each observation, you're going to um, make a note here about whether or not the candidate addressed what you asked them to, to address uh, in previous lessons. And does this uh, observation raise any serious concerns? You'll say yes or no. And this is just determined by where they are. So if the, the candidate teaches, after they teach their first lesson, and they don't do a good job with differentiated instruction, do you think that at that point in September that you should say yes, that it raised serious, con uh, serious concerns for you? Would it be reasonable at that point for you to say that? And noting that some of these candidates are just going into the classroom for the first time. Ms. Walker, do you think that would be reasonable? Um, I don't think it would raise serious concerns just because they haven't um, been in that atmosphere before. If it's just in September, now if we get to you know, November, December, that may would still be a serious concern, but I don't think so at the beginning. Oh, and that's why I'm just wanting to think about the timeline and you know when this is when these things are taking place. But uh, it, it would be a serious concern if um you know like after that first lesson and you have given them these suggestions or you know maybe two or three lessons in and they are still making the same error over and over again that you've already talked to them about then yes you know and anytime you uh check that yes it raises serious concerns it, you will need to reach out to miss howell okay and miss howell and i will uh, have a discussion so you know if you mark it here then that triggers that you need to contact Ms. Howell because we'll need to step in some and um, provide um, some, you know, intervene at this point. Ms. Howell, are you there? Okay. You. Yes, Sam, I'm here. Exactly. If you're filling out that paperwork during that lesson, if you see, oh my goodness, this is not, then just text me email me um, so we can go ahead and come on down because I mean if it's a serious something going on in your classroom let us know immediately and also I want you guys to think about this this is their first evaluation this is not a 4.0 it, it's our, our, our 3.0 I'm sorry it, it's not gonna happen you know evaluate them and think, well, you know what, they're, they're about 60, 70%, then your score should reflect that. 
if their first evaluation comes back and it's great all perfect, I'm gonna come knock on your door because that's not the case. Like she said, half of them have never been in the classroom. They're gonna be frozen like deer in the headlights. And you and I both know time management is probably gonna be that first uh, area to grow in and it, time is gonna nail them. You know, so just think about that, that, you know, if that first one is perfect, you call us because I want to see. Because, I mean, unless they're just coming to us and they're that magnificent, not saying it can't happen, but, I mean, all of us, we've been teaching a lot of years, and you and I can finish a lesson and think, oh, my goodness. You know, so just keep that in mind when you're evaluating. Yes, because it's about growth over time, growth over time. So they should not be receiving perfect ratings right out of the gates because we know that that's unrealistic um, for that to happen. And so Ms. Howell mentioned with pacing, um, you know, if, if pacing, if they are, uh, usually they take a, a, long, a longer time and they, they don't make it through the, the lesson, like they could start with the the introduction or the bell ringer to the lesson and that could be like 30 minutes and they're only left with 20 uh, for the rest of the, the lesson and they don't make it to the assessment and so um, you would give them some suggestions of how to address that so what are some suggestions that you can give them for pacing since you know that that's probably uh, going to be a common problem for all of them I'm asking you these questions because these are things that you're going to have to think through. And you might remember yesterday when I talked to you about, you know, how you're going to have to make your thoughts visible and really begin to think about those things that you just do with automaticity. You've been doing it for so long and it's automatic, but you, you need to um, teach your metacognition is going to be important in this process with you sharing your thoughts with the candidates. I don't remember having issues with this and um, it helped me to, when I, like, I know they have a detailed lesson plan, and so they have their opening and their POD. I would write the amount of time beside how much, and I would keep a clock, not where the students could see, but where I could see, and I would keep an eye on it. And it, after doing that several times, it helped me to do it without looking, but I had I remember having issues with that, and I had a question about the assessment. Are you saying that they have to have an assessment for at the end of each lesson? At the end, of like every at the end of every formal for their formal evaluations, yes, they do. Now, this is because this is a formal evaluation and a part of this process. If you go back and if we go back and look at the forms, because you. On a formal evaluation, the goal is for them to get eventually get a three on every area here. And so if they don't incorporate a full assessment for the lesson, like here, uh, you should be able to see my screen, uses formative and summative assessments to inform instruction by reflecting on mathematical proficiencies essential for all students. So uh, that is one area about assessment, uh, just on this form. So, if they don't include an assessment, then they're not going to be able to score at the top at the top levels. Now, you know, I know because I taught that, you know, there is not going to be a formal assessment at the end of every lesson that you teach during the day. Uh, here, this is back to page one, designing student assessment. So when you're going through this formal process, Ms. Morris, and well, all of you, the answer is yes, they have to have a formal assessment or they are not going to be able to get the full points here. Does that make sense? Um, for clarification, that assessment doesn't have to be like um, a long, because I'm thinking like when we teach, we teach like a week lesson before we do an assessment. And if they're just doing one lesson, is it, um, a shorter type of assessment or does it have a certain amount of length? It can or be it your just class, has to be... Right, it could be five problems. It could be your, okay. the classwork that you're working on. It could be like in math, you may have six problems. It, it can be that because they need to be able to take those five problems, do data analysis and see 
did those students achieve my objective? Did they learn the objective? They need to be able to say, okay, uh, four of them did not get it. Okay, what am I gonna do now? Half of them got it. They need to know from that bell curve, how many of them got it? You know, when they're done with that lesson, let's look at it, let's analyze the data. What are you gonna do for the students that didn't get it? Was this too easy? Was your five questions too easy? What are we gonna do? What about the higher students? So yeah, it can, it can be five questions. It can be the page 24 in your workbook. That can be their assessment, but they need to have formal and informal assessments going on during that lesson. Yes, because effective sure. teaching produces evidence of learning. And so when I sit down with a candidate after I have evaluated them and we're, we sit down for the post-conference, the very first question that I ask them is, uh, what are your thoughts about the lesson? was this a successful lesson in your opinion? And if they say yes, my next question is, how do you know? What evidence do you have? And so if they have not given some assessment, they're not going to know whether or not they're effective, if their instruction was effective. They have to have some evidence from the students, that they have to have some work the students have done to see if the students learned what they were expected to learn during the lesson. And so it, I don't want you to think of an assessment as a you know, four page test with multiple choice and true false, or I don't want you to think of it uh, in that way. As Ms. Howell said, it could be something just a short um, that uh, you use to uh, determine whether or not they met the objectives uh, for the lesson that they taught for the day. And I know some of your class periods are probably what, 50? I know sometimes at the middle school level, they might be 55 to 60 minutes. Or, sometimes uh, 100 minutes. 90 to some 100. of them are, I know some of them are not are 90 minutes or, you know, but there are some that are still about an hour in some of the middle schools. And uh, 47. <laughs> 47 minutes. See, yeah, that's what I know. They're still, yeah. I know they're short. Uh, so you would need to talk to the candidate about, you know, planning a lesson that they could accomplish all parts of it and demonstrate all parts of it uh, in a shorter, in that short period of time okay they may not you know for that short length of time they can't address you know it would be very difficult for them to address multiple uh, skills and concepts in that short period of time for formal evaluation okay. now if you when you are conducting it um, you could have it broken down into two days and evaluate over two days however when the university supervisor is observing they're only going to be there for that one class period. They're not going to come back a second day. Uh, that's usually not the way it works. And if they are even able to go into schools with everything going on, I know they, you know, it would be limited to the one, to the one day. Um, so I just want you to keep that in mind. It will be very important for you to look very closely at our evaluation and what's expected because, you know, part of your job is to help the candidate be able to um, do all of the things that are expected of them in a formal evaluation. Um, you could also, remember we, as we were talking about the co-teaching strategies, um, that the one teach, the one observe. Can you think of something that you could do with this instrument for one teach, one observe, while the candidate is observing you? Because I told you as they're observing, you have to give them something, um, you know, specifically to look for, um, not just sitting there watching with no intent, how could you use this instrument in the beginning to help them um, become more familiar with it? Go over it with them and give them examples of each section of what you will be looking for and how, if they're struggling with coming up with an example of a way to incorporate it into their lesson, maybe model it for them. Okay. Do they sit down with like one page of this instrument and ob ob observe you teaching and try to identify these things? Maybe not even um, like for the first one, maybe not all three domains, maybe just the classroom environment domain. That while they're observing your lesson, they'll be looking for these things and not not put a rating on it. You could take the ratings off because they don't they don't have to rate you, but they could be gathering evidence, looking for specific examples of these things while you are teaching. 
Like how did the teacher create an environment of respect and rapport during the lesson? Or how does she manage behavior? What about organizing the physical space? She had the materials already out on and accessible on the student's desk where they didn't have to get up or uh, she assigned materials, a materials manager from each group to um, retrieve the materials that were needed for the collaborative work the students were going to, or corporative work the students were going to be doing. You know, they might look at the classroom environment or then eventually at the instructional piece, communicating with students. How did the teacher communicate with the students? She gave verbal instructions. However, she also had the instructions posted on the board for the students to refer back to as they were working through the activities. Or how did uh, the teacher incorporate questioning and discussion techniques? When they've been in your classroom for about a month, like Ms. Wander said, take Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and have this three sections and tell them, you know, I want you to provide, you know, look for the evidence in this section. If there's none, there's none. And you may want to throw a kink in there and do something off just to see if they picked it up. But, you know, by at least midterm, I say midterm, our midterm, by October, November, they need to be aware of this because the thing is, is they're being evaluated from it. When you have their first evaluation, kind of like we always ask for, okay, well, how are you going to evaluate me? You know, let them know what's going on and make sure that they can give you a, a, a pro and a con of each one. Like Ms. Wander said, make sure that they can give you a, a what should I see here? What should I not see here for each, for each listing? Because I mean, that's, a, that's important that they understand from the get-go how they're gonna be evaluated and what's expected and what's not. Yes, thank you. And it's, uh, it's important for you and the resident to, you know, um, know uh, what's expected based on our, our evaluation instrument. So by using it, you know, as a, a, an assignment for the candidates while they are observing uh, in your classroom, or maybe even in the classroom of one of your colleagues, because we encourage you to send them uh, to other classrooms as well. Um, you know, here are the look for's. Okay, it will help them to gather some examples because they are going to be planning to um, planning instruction that's, um, you know, covers all of these things. Okay, and uh, I'm, I know we're just going through this, this briefly, but as I said, we're going to have more work with it. You will be provided uh, copies of it when I send all, all of the forms and I will do that uh, early next week. I'll put together an entire file of forms to send of all of the uh, things that uh, we have been talking about over the past uh, two days uh, so that you can have uh, access to them uh, and and refer back to them as you are making preparations uh, for your residents to come. And so um, with that being said, I just want to stop now and give Ms. Cowley an opportunity to talk to you about the resident that will be coming to your classroom. And then we'll finish up our discussion with just, um, you know, takeaways and um, kind of set you on the path to um, being better prepared when the resident shows up. So Ms. Cowley, you want to talk to them now? All right. So some of you may or may not know um, who your resident is for this coming school year. And so I figured it'd just be easier just to share out the list here um, of where, of who, the name of your resident. Um, we are, Miss Hal and I are doing a check-in meeting with uh, the group of residents on Monday to also share this. And then we will just, uh, Miss Hal and I will discuss about the best way possible for you guys to actually connect. So, um, but for the moment, I just wanted to go ahead and share this list with you. So you can see who your resident is as far as their name. And um, of course, once y'all meet then as, as far as like really getting to know your resident, the information they wanna share with you, you know, um, I didn't wanna go too much into those details because I just don't feel like I have that authority to <clears throat> tell you about all their stuff that they have in their lives. But uh, 
even though you know that we share information information within a uh, course with NSU but um, you know I think it's important for them to tell you who they are and what they've done and um, what how maybe um, what they think about this uh, experience coming up and maybe even some of the concerns or uh, things that they're anticipating and have questions about you know uh, I want that to be held for you guys um, in that moment of being able to connect with them and communicate with them and get to know them and build that rapport with them most of all so um, but this is the name of your resident uh, you might want to jot it down of course like I mentioned some of you probably already know your resident um, I know especially with those smaller communities everybody knows everybody and of course a few of these have taught at the class at, at the school that you're at now um, and they've decided to you know go through this program to get their teacher certification Jennifer can I jump in and ask a question sure it's since they're not being able to meet face to face are we gonna share I guess cell phone numbers mm -hmm. or an emails with you know and and who's not wanting to share their cell phone number whether it be a resident whether it be a, a mentor teacher that way I mean is everyone okay you guys with extent exchanging cell phone numbers so that we can give you the resident or give the resident your cell phone number because I really don't know any other way you're going to communicate or I mean email but I'm I mean, fine with that. is there um, anyone not okay with it I'm sorry, Jennifer, I just don't know how, other than swapping phone numbers and email, mm -hmm. I, I feel like, you know, we can send them out saying, you know, okay, at least send an email link or, or a text to each one of them saying, this is your resident, this is their cell number, this is your mentor teacher, this is their cell number, because, I mean, you know all of us, we don't answer some numbers we don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, well, most definitely. Um... You know, um, I was actually kind of wanting to think outside the box for y'all to meet your resident, even if it's something, uh, you know. Um, Another Zoom meeting, maybe? A, a Zoom Yeah, kind of that's, that's the kind of thing, as far as exchanging information, you know, that's something that I think is should be discussed between the mentor and the resident individually. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, something I, you know, I'm trying to think more about, you know, how um, we can meet up, uh, just giving the situation of, you know, there's a limited capacity of, of people in one room together, even if it's something that's broken up, uh, you know, if I have to split it into groups. Can we do this? If, let's say that, remember how we met some at the coffee shop by your office, if we can't do that, can we do like a, a Zoom, you know, a, a, a welcome? Let's say that Miss, Miss Adams says that she can Zoom in at nine, her resident Zooms in at nine and all four or five of us are there just for that meeting if we can't yeah. do a face-to-face. -face. Absolutely. And just let both of them agree on a time and that we can all log in, you know, and that go for, like you said, go from there with the exchange and phone numbers. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, we could discuss more of that after this, um, but the, I just wanted to make sure that uh, our mentor teachers know the name of their resident. Right, do you and guys- And how teachers, they meet. Have any yeah, mentor teachers, do y'all have any suggestions on how you can meet them, how we can meet them, whether it be virtually, y'all, anything out there popping up? Um, do we all need to meet or just us and the resident teacher? Just you and the resident. Oh, I think, um, I think that as long as we were able to exchange cell phone numbers, that just talking or FaceTiming would be fine. Okay. In my opinion. I was thinking that maybe you could give the residents our numbers they could reach out to us then we could get their numbers and then that could be handled I mean unless there's anyone on here that doesn't want to share their number and if you don't there's an app we can use that'll hide your number like we use for our parents when we were teaching aren't we gonna have to be able to communicate with them anyway to let them know about beginning of the year meetings and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff yes 
Yes. And I want to say to you um, that one of the things that we did last year um, with this, you know, when we were able to meet face to face and the mentors had an opportunity to um, do the, the greet, meet and, and greet uh, with their residents is that uh, we asked the mentors to put, to make a bag uh, for the residents um, with just helpful information, maybe a school t-shirt. Um, if a school shirt is available, you may ask your principal. Uh, I don't want you to go out and, and spend your own money on it, but you would fill the bag with some things just as a welcome gift uh, for the resident. I know, um, I, well, I heard, and I know we have some people from Wynn Parish on, but I heard that uh, in Wynn that all the students have to wear a mask that's the color of their school uniform. Okay, I don't know if those are going to be given to the teachers or if there's a fee. I mean, you might want to include that, but that's certainly something that you would need to communicate with the resident so that he or she could purchase one before school starts, or you might have little things of hand sanitizer, something in a bag that you can put together as a, a welcome gift uh, for your resident. But uh, they need to be, you know, you need to be able to communicate with them. I don't see where anybody should be uh, concerned about sharing their phone number because through this process, hopefully you all will become friends. You're going to be working cooperatively and collaboratively in the classroom. And, you know, in some districts, they haven't even decided about, you know, how school is going to be structured, when it's going to start. The residents are expected to start when you start and you're going to be getting the information emailed to you and you'll need to relay that to them and pass it on. So it's important that you are open to sharing your your cell phone number, and I know I don't think any of you have objected to that, but I just want to put those things on your mind. Whatever you know it, whatever you, whenever you get information, then you need to pass that on to um, the residents. And like, if they need to go out and get the mask um, that's appropriate for school, you know, share that information with them now. Um, if you can get together teachers' manuals, guides, you know, whatever, share that with them now. You all make plans to. Uh, to meet up, stay six feet apart, wear your mask, but <laughs> there's some uh, critical information and things they need at this point. Ken, does everyone uh, feel, uh, can everyone, how about uh, if everyone will send their contact information to Ms. Howell that needs to be shared with the resident? I don't mind my number being shared, but I don't normally answer numbers I don't recognize. So maybe if they could send a text saying, hey, I'm your mm -hmm. mentee, student teacher or whatever, then I would know to answer it. Okay. Can everybody send their information, uh, their uh, phone numbers, or if you prefer to respond an email to Ms. Howell by the end of the day? Because we will be meeting with them on Monday, so we definitely want to be able to exchange that information with them that day. Odie, I don't think I have your email address. Can you post that? Um, if you'll look on the last email, I should be listed under there with your uh, homework assignment. No, I'm Hal J. Okay, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'll send it to you, but if you'll... If, um, it should say Hal J at NSU LA.edu, and that way you don't have to re-click anything. If you'll just, you should be able to go in there and respond. Let's see. But just in case, it's um, Howell H O W E L L J at NSU LA.edu. And then when I get your cell, um, when I get y'all cell number, I'll send y'all mine as well, okay? Because like I said, I'm not in the office. I work from, um, I'm home base right now. Um, do we still need to send it if our resident already has our information? Now, ma'am, you're good. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else, Ms. Cowley? Yeah, that was it. Okay. All right, Ms. Howe, can you think of anything else? Um, no, ma'am. I will email them the suggested calendar, and you guys 
don't freak out when you feel like we're not there yet. We're ahead. Use it as a guide, you know, and we're always a, a phone call or an email away. We are so appreciative that you guys are allowing us to put a resident in your room. That says a lot about you as a teacher, as an educator. Um, like I said, don't struggle with anything. Let us know when you have questions. Um, when you start the evaluation a day or two before, if you want to call myself, Miss Launder, okay, let's walk through this one more time. You know, we're here to help you guys. Don't feel like, you know, that you're out there on your own. The past, uh, the past mentor teachers can tell you, you call me, I'm going to show up. You don't call me, I'm still going to show up. <laughs> But I mean, we, you do see our face. This is not something where, you know, we close the door on you and you don't hear from us. Yeah. I had one more question. I'm sorry. <clears throat> you might have already addressed this at the beginning. Um, what about our W-9s? What do we need to do with those? You need to send them to me because I have to uh, send uh, whenever I, uh, let me start over. I need those W-9s to submit to accounting so your second check can be cut, but also your supplemental pay for uh, training. Okay. You can, if you can, if you can't scan it and you just want to take a picture and send it, or if you want to mail it, that's up to you. We also have fax. Do I need another W-9 or? No, if you're a second year mentor teacher, I already have your information, so you're good to go. And that's Ms. Clark, uh, Mr. McGraw, and you, Ms. Jones, and Ms. Ms. Smith, but she's not with us right now today. Y'all are good. I'm my, first, my new mentor teachers. I need uh, the W-9. If you have any questions about filling it out, it's, it's one of those things if you, <laughs> You don't fill them out a whole lot. <laughs> so when you look at it, you're like, oh gosh, where did I begin? It's just your name, your address, and then there's a signature line. That's all I need. Okay. All right, well, thank you all. And um, I want to just um, close and summarize um, what, what our discussion, and I want to let you know that the goal was just to give you an introduction uh, to, um, to mentoring and specifically to mentoring a CLIP resident and to um, let you know about